I'm Tom Morello, and you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, Steve. And we also have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hi. Anti-racism activists in America have achieved a lot. They uh, brought us the abolition of slavery in the 1800s and the civil rights movement of the 1900s. But what about 21st century anti-racism? What are today's anti-racism activists fighting for? And does their work materially improve lives or is it all about the performance of being anti-racist? Our first guest today will be author, linguist, and Columbia University professor John McWhorter. In his new book, Woke Racism, he argues that today's anti-racism isn't a pragmatic progressive ideology making things better for real people. Instead, he argues that it is actively harmful to Black people and is more like a religion than a true social justice movement. We look forward to speaking with Professor McWhorter about his book, as well as his thoughts on how illiberal tendencies on both sides of the political spectrum can lead to censorship. In the second half of the show, we'll welcome Father Albert Fritsch, co-author of Ethnic Atlas of the United States. Father Fritsch was co-founder of the Center for Science and the Public Interest that quickly became America's leading food safety and nutrition advocacy organization. They campaigned for reforms such as the elimination of sulfite preservatives on fresh foods and nutritional product labeling we now take for granted. Today, we're going to find out from Father Fritsch why ethnicity matters. As always, somewhere in the middle, we'll check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, let's find out what our first guest means when he talks about woke racism. David? John McWhorter is a professor of linguistics at Columbia University. Professor McWhorter is a columnist for The New York Times and author of more than a dozen books, including Our Magnificent Bastard Tongue, The Untold History of English, Words on the Move, Why English Won't and Can't Sit Still Like Literally. And his new book is entitled Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor John McWhorter. Happy to be here. Welcome indeed, John. In your book, you frame it on page four, and I want to quote, one can divide anti-racism into three waves along the lines that feminism has been. First wave anti-racism battled slavery and legalized segregation. Second wave anti-racism in the 1970s and 80s battled racist attitudes and taught America that being racist is a moral flaw. Third wave anti-racism becoming mainstream in the 2010s teaches that because racism is baked into the structure of society, whites' complicity in living within it constitutes racism itself, while for black people, grappling with the racism surrounding them is the totality of experience and must condition exquisite sensitivity toward them, including a suspension of standards of achievement and conduct. End quote. And what your book is about is a critique of this third wave. And as I always promise my listeners, we're going to start with specific examples. Could you give three or four examples? And I want to add one myself. Can you start with the example of Alison Roman, who was a food editor for the New York Times, and what happened to her? Yeah, a couple of years ago, Alison Roman made some snarky comments about Marie Kondo, who is a Japanese citizen, and Chrissy Teigen, who is a model who is half Thai. And she was just making some jokes about how they seem to have gone commercial. And Alison Roman was suspended from the New York Times and eventually left it. Basically, she had to leave the job. And it was because she was processed as having ridiculed two women of color. Now, when we talk about people of color and why we want to be sensitive to any degree to people of color, we're not usually thinking about Japanese citizens and somebody who is half Thai, but lives essentially as you know just an undefinable American person. It's not really what it means. And yet her life was transformed by simply some snarky comments in one interview. What happened to her? Well, she was suspended, and for a long time you didn't hear anything from her, and eventually she left, and now she is blogging and podcasting, I think, 
on her own. And so it's not that she's selling pencils on the street, but if she hadn't made those snarky comments, she would still have her post at the newspaper that she worked for. That was the first example that made me think, what's going on here? Because she would not have been suspended for the little comments that she made about those particular people, probably even just a year before. It was in spring of 2020 that things started to change in a really radical way. Okay, the next one. Leslie Neal Boylan was a head of a department of nursing. And during the post-George Floyd racial reckoning period in mid-2020, she wrote an email circulated among the people she worked with saying- This is at the University of Massachusetts, right? That's right. And it said that Black Lives Matter and also All Lives Matter. So she said she understood what we'll go through, Black Lives Matter, and then in a salutary sense, coming from somebody who's concerned with health care for all people, she said also All Lives Matter. She wasn't contradicting Black Lives Matter or putting it down. She was just making a valedictory and humanist statement. And because of that, she lost her job because she was taken as somehow denying the legitimacy of Black Lives Matter and its claims when she simply wasn't. That wasn't right. It was unjust. And it was another thing that happened that made me realize we were in a whole new world. Then there's David Shore. Appalling. David Shore reported on some work that a Black political scientist had done. This Black political scientist showed that the riots in the late 1960s during the long hot summers And events like that have a way of making white people more likely to vote Republican. That was a fact that a black political scientist had done a study showing. Now, there are all sorts of places you can take that. David Shore reported it. He was interpreted as saying that black people shouldn't protest. And therefore, he was removed from his position at that time out of an idea that it had been racist to, quote, this article, which had initially been distributed with you know, great praise in the media by a black young political scientist who had all of the right intentions that people expect. So that wasn't right. And all of these things happened. It was like dominoes falling. And it was rather alarming to see these things going on because they don't make any kind of moral sense. And I just realized that all of these things are connected. It isn't that people are going crazy, because very few people are crazy, but all of these things are connected to something larger. And I wanted to get a sense of what it was, why all of this became so much more likely after the murder of George Floyd in the spring of 2020. Let's talk about two other examples. One, Evergreen College. Oh, goodness. That was before this period, but it was the beginning of this kind of storm. The thing about Evergreen College is that that kind of thing is now normal. Brett Weinstein was a biology professor there, and there emerged a call for all non-Black professors, I think, to desert the campus for a day so that only Black students and teachers could occupy it and be free of the burden of the racism that they experience on the campus every day with white people on it. Brett Weinstein refused to observe that, and as a result, was all but physically assaulted at his office. He was screamed at, terrible things were said about him, and it got to the point that campus security could not guarantee his safety, and he had to leave the job. That was appalling then, but we tended to classify it as campus is going crazy. The thing is that at this point, that sort of thing seems perfectly normal and isn't just campuses. That kind of attitude, which looked like something that happens at crazy little places like Evergreen College, is now all of American society. Nobody would blink if that happened now. And it's not just campuses. Just less than a year ago, the editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, the main newspaper in Philadelphia, who was editor for 12 years, people seemed to like him. He'd worked before for years before he became editor at the Inquirer. And it turned out the architectural editor wrote an article, and the title was Public Buildings Matter. And he was talking about how powerful demonstrations in the streets can affect public buildings. And some of the staff rose up and said this was racist, demanded the editor, who had really nothing to do with the article, the editor resigned. He did resign, and he apologized. Well, my take on that is, number one, there was no due process. He was not given a chance to defend himself. Mm -hmm. Second, it was certainly disproportionate penalty for what this man allegedly was held responsible for, his own architectural critic. And third, of course, is the commentary are 
do people have a monopoly on language? Only corporations have a monopoly on language. They trademark their various phrases and slogans. And then just a few days ago, the New York Times and Washington Post reported that the president of Estee Lauder, the big cosmetic company who makes nine and a half million dollars a year, that's about over $5,000 an hour, eight hours a day, he was pushed out. And could you explain that just for a minute, Steve? Yeah. From the Washington Post article, I'll quote John Dempsey, who is the executive group president of Estee Lauder Companies, was told to leave the cosmetic giant effective this week after posting a meme spoofing a Sesame Street children's book cover. The meme, which showed Big Bird wearing a surgical mask while standing at a sick Snuffleupagus's bedside, used a redacted version of the N-word in the title while stating that Snuffy had contracted the coronavirus at a Chingy concert. Chingy is a black rapper. The post had been removed and Dempsey apologized. So that was that case. Well, there's something obviously that John's book points out. There's something very powerful going on here. Corporation executives don't get forced out for producing deadly products that kill, injure, and sicken people or to cheat people on their billings or to deny them illegally health care or to redline whole areas of cities or to profit from Wall Street all the way down to the loan sharks at the payday loan rackets and lower income areas. <laughs> but I guess there's one way to deal with corporate accountability is to have these corporate executives say the wrong word at any given time, and then they're held accountable. Well, this is all about censorship. It's all about lack of due process. It's all about a kind of fever that's catching on here by people who hurl the phrase racist or hurl the phrase sexist, but don't really do anything on the ground with their time about real racism, some of which I just described, and many were described in John's book, and real sexism. Now, before you get into your argument, there are two questions that popped up in reading the book. And one is, why weren't you as upset with the Trumpster racism, which seems to be really real here, and you raise that in your book? And the, the second question that often arises is that on the ground, where people live, work, and raise their family, they are afflicted by a racism that's traced directly to corporate crime, fraud, abuse, corporate coercion, corporate control, which, of course, disadvantages and harms everybody. That's indiscriminate injustice, but also has a severe added effect on people who can't defend themselves at all and never get their calls returned, usually low-income minority people. So could you comment on just those two you know, every time someone writes a book, someone tries to comment and say, you didn't write the book I wanted you to write. <laughs> and so I understand that. <laughs> but in this discussion, what about the Trumpsters in your framework here? And what about corporate induced or corporate provoked racism? Yeah, I would say that as far as Donald Trump and his you know, obvious, casual, Archie Bunker style racism, the question is, how did it hurt black America? Now, it was rather repulsive to see, but to the extent that you could not say that Black America was harmed by how that man felt about Black people, it just struck me as not as interesting, not as important as many people seem to think it should be. I am not a Trump fan for many reasons. His racism is frankly around the bottom of the list because I think that he had effects on many more things, much more important than racial attitudes. There are too many black people who like Donald Trump for me to feel too bad about his racism. And the fact is, it's not something that I kept an eye on with a special zeal, but black people actually overall did better under Trump financially than they happened to under Obama. So for me, the main issue was that, of course, racism exists, but I think that we Black people are taught to exaggerate the degree to which it's important, and especially since about two years ago, a certain class of white person has taken our side in very large numbers in contributing to that kind of exaggeration and all of this recreational punitiveness 
of the sort that we've been referring to on this episode. And as far as corporate racism, all of that is very real. And I think it's almost criminal that we talk less about that than some post on an Instagram that this person makes because he's had maybe a couple beers and thinks something is funny. With the idea being that our job is to police society for what we think of as heresy, because that's really what's going on, as opposed to thinking about what actually hurts real black people living in the real world. And one thing I know is that it's perhaps more fun to chase a CEO out of his job because he posted something with the N-word in it than to actually go out into the world and work on things such as environmental racism, work on things that bedevil people of low income among whom black people are disproportionately represented. I think a lot of people are really just having a kind of fun and that's just not enough. That's not civil rights. Well, you know, you mentioned law schools and I've been to a lot of law schools speaking and the students now go crazy if they hear an ethnic, racial or, or sexist slur but they're not very mobilized on the conditions reflected by those words where they go to law school. Some of them do clinics, of course, and they help the poor. But by and large, there's this verbal fever, which is expressed in very symbolic ways, but is separated from the reality on the ground. The poor, which are more than represented by minorities, pay more, they die earlier, because of the healthcare system and how it denies them and deprives them. They are basically blocked from access to justice in so many ways. They can't get to their jobs because the public transit is underinvested compared to highways. And it just goes on and on. And it's gone to the point now, the fever that you describe, and I would call them mindsetters. I know you call them elect. Mm -hmm. I would call them mindsetters that they basically tell you what you got to think, and you're supposed to shut up and not even respond, which is censorship incarnate. When I was in law school, most of the censorship came from the right wing, from the conservatives, exactly. censoring books and films and things like that. Now it is spread into what is euphemistically called the left or the liberal. But you have people now who want to change the name of Columbus, Ohio, get rid of the Washington Monument, and change the name of colleges that have Jefferson in it. What's your take on all that? And they do it because, you know, these people were slavers. And in Columbus's case, he slaughtered the natives that greeted him when he landed in the Caribbean islands, etc. What's your take on that? Because that seems to be roaring through schools. There are buildings at Berkeley that are being demanded to be renamed because of some minor failing of the person named 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's going on here is that I think to oversimplify it in terms of who's represented, white people do this as a kind of virtue signaling. The idea is that to show that you're a good person, you show that you understand that racism exists and has existed, and that you know that racism is what we call systemic or institutional. So the idea is not to show that you have faith in God, or Jesus, the idea is to show that you understand that racism exists. And for people like this, they've taken on a sense that the acknowledgement of racism is the central intellectual and moral duty of the enlightened person. Not just one of many things, but what should be the focus of how you process the world. So it's become what I term a religion, and many people would consider it to be something else, but it's important to realize how central the idea of battling power differentials wielded by whites. This has become to that kind of person. Black people engage in this sort of thing because it's very easy to fall for an idea that what makes you important is your status as a victim. The victim complex is a human issue. It's not something that only happens to black people, but because of the cocktail of factors that affect black people and have created black history in this country, it is easy as a black person to develop a sense that what makes you most important, what makes you most interesting, what gives your life its purpose is your role as a victim who survives despite obstacles and your role as somebody whose job is to announce that racism still exists, but it's just underground. It's not as obvious as it used to be. You feel like you have a purpose. You feel noble in that way. The noble victim is a human type. The Black people who are noble victims engage in things such as 
pretending that taking Thomas Jefferson's names off of buildings is going to change anything or affect anything or it's necessary. All these people, white and black, are pretending that nothing is ever passed. They're pretending not to understand that people at different points in time naturally are going to have failings compared to how we see things now and that race is not going to be an exception with those sorts of things. Deep down, all those people understand that, but they need to show that racism exists. And there are all sorts of ways of doing it. And if the pickings get slim, next thing you know, you're trying to pull someone's name off of the building because of one thing that they said in one book in 1943. Because when you do it, even if you don't get what you want, you have shown that you know that racism exists and has existed. It's a very narrow way of looking at things, but only in understanding it can we see why so many people are so caught up in such trivia and willing to destroy people's lives on the basis of it. At the same time, you know, there are thousands of large landlords violating the law and not changing the content of the paint in their buildings and their apartments, and there's still lead paint being chipped off and leading to brain damage, mostly in poor areas. We don't see many people who you've described going after these landlords as racist. It's a violent racism. What you're talking about more is a verbal back and forth here. So let's take your metaphor, or if it wasn't a metaphor, you called it in religion. Who are the priesthoods here in this religion? And who are the enforcers? I mean, for example, how do these CEOs get toppled? What happens when the accusation is made or the revelation occurs? And suddenly within hours or days, these all-powerful CEOs who push people around and exploit people and pollute the air and forget about global crisis, keeps pumping more oil, gas, coal, greenhouse gases, they stay in place, but suddenly they're removed. What exactly is the enforcement mechanism there, and what is the priesthood? Well, often how these things happen is that the younger staffers are up in arms. The middle-aged staffers kind of scratch their chins and go along with it because they don't want to be called racists on Twitter and on Slack. But it's usually people under about 35 who feel that heads must roll because of this sort of thing. And then even people older than that are beginning to think that it's better to let that head roll for PR reasons, because you don't want to lose the business. You don't want to lose the custom, so to speak, of people who are hyper-woke because the hyper-woke have money just like everybody else. And so the enforcers nowadays, I find when I hear about these cases, and even there, you know, there's a cadre of linguists who feel that way about me. There's nothing they can fire me from, but it's there. It's younger people who are thinking in this way. And what's scary is that in about 10 or 15 years, they're going to be middle-aged and therefore have full access to the levers of power. The priests with this elect religion tend to be writers. It's interesting. It's not preachers anymore, like with the old time civil rights movement. It tends to be certain academics and journalists who are taken up as those who are preaching the good word. And so, for example, ta Coates has largely withdrawn from the punditry scene at this point, but he got a lot of this started in terms of laying some of the groundwork. I think he is the one who popularized in an influential way the use of the term white supremacy in place of racist, for example. He wrote for The Atlantic, or today two of the priests are the sociologist Robin D'Angelo, who wrote her best-selling book, White Fragility, or the African-American studies professor Ibram Kendi, who has written some books taking a certain radical position about what racism is. So those are the priests. As I say in the book, you could have a trilogy of Ta-Nehisi Coates' best-selling book, Ibram Kendi's best-selling book, and Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, and that would be three testaments of a kind of new anti-racist Bible, because those three books really are read as if they were liturgy rather than pieces of opinion. And White Fragility is still selling. It came out in 2018. It was around 300 or so on Amazon today. Your book is around 3,000 on Mm -hmm. Amazon today. So you're getting quite a hearing here. You appear in the New York Times. What kind of progress are you making against what I call this censorship that's going on? I mean, whether you agree with these people or not, most of them are not doers to begin with. Uh, They don't follow up their knowledge with action. And second, the censorship is 
quite pronounced. I mean, it's like if you dare response, you lose your job. And that doesn't seem to be abating. So what kind of sport are you getting on campuses, for example, say Columbia? You know, the truth is, from what I know, maybe this will change, but from what I know, Columbia does not have a problem with me. If anything, they just think of me as one of their professors whose name is out there, which redounds well to the Columbia brand, I suppose. So I don't have that story to tell, but I think that what I'm detecting, despite cases like the Estee Lauder case, is that it's less likely nowadays that somebody gets fired for a minor transgression than it was in 2020. In 2020, all anybody had to do was snap their fingers. Now, an increasing number of people are resisting. And I hope that continues because my job, as I see it, is just to embolden as many people as possible to speak out when they see this sort of thing happening, instead of watching it happen and knowing that it's wrong, but not saying anything out of fear of losing their jobs. If you don't think you're gonna lose your job, speak up. And I think, that if that happens to a considerable degree, and I suspect that it's going to, because it's what we see is so clearly egregious, and we're coming out of our houses now, we're not huddling during a pandemic, we can return to the paradise of 2019, because really all of this does a phase shift in about April of 2020. That's what I want to get us away from. And you're a linguist, and words in our culture seems to matter more than deeds, bad deeds are widely ignored, but words really send up the fever in people. What's your view of that? Why are otherwise bright, articulate students at universities and colleges so obsessed with words and symbols? For example, they would have a nationwide petition demanding Trump's resignation. If Trump was caught on a recorder in the White House saying the N-word, the S-word against Hispanics, and the K-word against Jews. And they would never have a national petition. The fact that he spent four years selling the U.S. government to Wall Street and enriching himself and his family, there's no national protest from the campuses. How do you explain (laughs) that kind of divergence of consciousness by people who are supposed to be thinking every day in their educational experience. Yeah, what you're talking about really does get at the heart of it. And I would have to say, despite that I'm a linguist and people are waiting for me to have a linguist take on this, it's less the words that are making people so upset than you can put words together in such a way that suggests that you are not aware of or concerned sufficiently about the role of racism in American society. And that, to these people, is a heresy and means that you can no longer be in the room. And the reason I call it religious is because, as you say, it really doesn't make any sense if you pull the camera just a few feet back and see that there are things that you could despise about Trump deeply that affect actual lives so much more than some word. And yet you're quite right. If he had been caught using the N-word in the Oval Office or outside of it, then there would have been this national outcry far above and beyond the horrible things that he actually did to the country all the way up to when he finally had to leave Washington. It is analogous to the kind of person who calls for defunding the police in neighborhoods where everybody who actually lives there wants there to be more police. That makes no blessed sense at all that somebody would consider themselves an anti-racist by calling for defunding the police, except that when you call for defunding the police, you're showing that you know racism exists. And if that's of paramount importance, then that explains why a sane, smart, concerned person would cherish the idea of defunding the police, even though it would hurt the people who they call themselves being an ally of. There's a mental blockage involved here. And so, yes, you see injustice being allowed to pass, being seen as uninteresting, while something somebody says that suggests that they don't have a proper allegiance to one small thing is enough to make them deserve to have their life destroyed. That's the problem. Yeah. How do you explain the post-George Floyd phenomena reflected in National Public Radio, New York Times, Mm -hmm. where they focus on discriminatory injustice? They always have interviews of minorities who are being cheated, being harmed, being excluded, being discriminated against. It's what I call plight radio, but they never go to the causes. 
They just stay with the human interest of the interviews. What do you see about this? I mean, is this a guilt complex here by the whites that dominate NPR at the top and the New York Times at the top? (laughs) Well, I'm not in a position to say very much about the Times because I work for them now. But what you are referring to in general is this religion where what it comes down to is this. Racism does exist in this society in terms of personal racism. There are inequities that are certainly the result of racism in the past and sometimes racism in the present, although usually systemic, what's called systemic racism in terms of the present is too complicated to really deserve the name racism, but these race-based inequities are there. But I think in 50 years, when people look back on the mainstream media and its obsessive concern with what it calls racism. It's going to be found peculiar. There are Europeans who observe this kind of media coverage and innocently, sincerely believe that being Black in the United States is this ongoing tragedy, that even somebody like me lives a life that somebody like me would have lived in, say, 1960. You know, just constant microaggressions and, you know, doors closed and the police grabbing me for no real reason, et cetera. And we all know that that's not true. However, there is a narrative that we're taught to follow, and it is to acknowledge that racism exists as a central concern. And woke racism is about that fetish, because many people want to say, well, what's wrong with acknowledging racism? And the issue is, you can get to the point where you are covering racism, acknowledging racism, showing people that you know what it is, to such an obsessive and self-centered extent that you're not really concerned with the people themselves. And Ralph, you completely get this, I can see, that all of this has nothing to do with actually wanting to change the lives of real people out on the ground. It's a performance largely for overeducated people who don't have enough to do. And I think it needs to be called out. You know, I've often said you can't talk about racism if you don't talk about class. Cornell West wrote tracks called Race Matters and Class Matters. And class means you have to talk about corporate crime, corporate fraud, corporate control, corporate coercion, corporate censorship. I mean, just look at the fine print contracts. We've lost our freedom of contract in this country. Let me put this generically to you. We're talking with Professor John McWhorter, author of the best-selling book, Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America, published by Penguin. Let's go back to the slave trade. Simple question. Was the slave trade provoked by profit or race? Oh, is that a question for me? Oh, it was was about profit. And it was considered tolerable because people of the black race were considered less than human, if I'm answering the question properly. Right. Now, what if there was no profit? Would it be done? No. Yes. Would would there have been a slave trade? No, there's slavery is about pragmatism, and that's why there's been forms of slavery worldwide, you know, since the dawn of time. And when the slaves came to the United States by the time of the Civil War, they were deemed by economists to represent the greatest economic asset in the country in terms of dollar value. Certainly. When I was at law school, we read law cases at the appellate level. Very rarely did we go to the trial record. Because Harvard Law School students were not going to be trial lawyers. They were going to be appellate lawyers. They were going to work for these corporate law firms. And I noticed that there never was a case in the contracts book or the tort book involving slavery, even though before the Civil War, the courts were filled with conflicts between slave owners against slave owners over who owned who. And there were actually some lawsuits against slaveholders for committing wrongful injuries. And so I looked into it. I said, how could this be? You know, they have cases going back to medieval England. It turns out that West Publishing Company, that published all these case books for law schools, didn't want to put slave-related cases because it would have offended the Southern law schools. Interesting, yeah. And this kind of censorship and it affected Native Americans, affected a lot of other ethnic groups, infected the books that were used 
mm-hmm. all over the country and at the undergraduate level as well. So there's a great opportunity to understand what you're talking about, not just with our antipathy to censorship, to the refusal to dialogue, to the penalty punishment far exceeding the alleged crime, to the emphasis on words by people who wouldn't exert any effort to change the deeds of injustice on the ground. But I think we really have to connect class with race here. There are 60 million poor whites in this country who, if they bother to listen to NPR, would be entitled to ask the question, hey, what about us? What about our plight? Give us your views on class and race. You know, that's a tough one in this country because we like to pretend that class isn't real or we don't find it as interesting because especially educated people are taught that what we're supposed to focus on is race and racism. But one of the most awkward things about the conversation on race over about the past 20 years is that it's increasingly clear that thinking of there being a black underclass that is in a special danger, is in especially hopeless circumstances, is obsolete. It's at the point where if we're talking about grinding multi-generational poverty, the white story, if we talk about the methamphetamine epidemic, if we talk about the hillbilly elegy by J.D. Vance, that problem is just as large, just as difficult to solve, and just as tragic as what is suffered by a disproportion of Black people. The idea among many is that the Black story is more important because slaves were brought here in chains and then there was Jim Crow. But it gets to the point where, once again, it's a rather peculiar attitude towards the past. At what point is the past the past? At what point do you stop being able to say things are this way in a flowchart, mousetrap kind of way, Rube Goldberg kind of way, because of things that happened in the 1700s and the 1800s, or even at this point in the middle of the 20th century, if you're going to talk about redlining. And so, yeah, really, we will be better off if we thought about class, for example, in affirmative action. It's one thing in 1966 to say that we're going to lower standards for all Black people in order to have more brown faces at our school. That made sense, especially because a vaster disproportion of Black people were poor or close to it at the time. But generations later, when it's not at all unusual to be a Black person like me, and in fact, by some arguments, Black people like me, middle class, outnumber the ones who are part of anything that you would call an underclass, It gets to the point where you should be able to say out loud, affirmative action should be about disadvantage, not about skin color. Yet for many people, that's uncomfortable. They don't want to hear it because there's supposed to be an idea that blackness is a uniquely difficult condition, that America is uniquely responsible for attending to the needs of all black people now. And yeah, it's the problem with all of that is that you can fashion these arguments for people who have time to chew on them and are inclined to twist their heads around unusual notions. That will never be most human beings. And I don't think that the way this sort of thing is being presented is ever going to convince conclusive section of the public. Our sense of root causes has gone completely crazy. And you were present at a time when the argument was made more coherently. In the 1960s, America needed to hear about root causes. But it's taken on a meme-like status now where it's used to excuse anything and to avoid dealing with realities such as that, yes, today we need to be talking about a race-neutral general underclass rather than pretending that the plight of Black people in the inner cities in Philadelphia and Cleveland and Oakland is somehow more important than the legions and legions of white people living very similar lives with similarly hopeless prospects. Well, we've gone from, you know, the 1950s when kids would be taunted and they'd say, quote, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me, end quote, to microaggressions where teachers will say, we're going to discuss something that might upset you tomorrow, students, so you're free not to attend because you might be offended or harmed psychologically. What's your take on that? Yeah. The reason for that, which, you know, sounds so ridiculous, is because you can listen to somebody say something and read it as indicating that they don't understand how important racism is. And because we've decided that that's so very, very important, it means that you sacrifice something as sensible as sticks and stones. Nothing ever seemed to make more sense 
than that old mantra. You cannot hurt me with words. And that should include, if you ask me, although I get the feeling I'm a radical on this, the N-word. You cannot hurt me by saying a word, not significantly. I won't give you the power. Everybody understands that on a certain level, but the way we talk about race in this country entails tacitly that you suspend basic principles of cognitive health in order to engage in a certain kind of performance. It's sad and it's fake, and you are revealing the extent of that in recalling sticks and stones may break my bones. I was raised on that too, but now I imagine we're supposed to see that as some sort of barbarism from the past. Anyway, unfortunately, we're out of time. We've been talking with Professor John McWhorter of Columbia University. His book is called Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America. And if anybody wants to contact you, do you want to give a website, John? I don't have things like websites, but I teach at Columbia and people can find me on the usual you know, social media platforms if they want to. Okay. Well, thank you again, John. Unfortunately, our time is up. Thank you very much, Professor John McWhorter. And thank you. We've been speaking with Professor John McWhorter. We will link to his new book, Woke Racism, at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, Ethnic Atlas of the United States, appropriately enough. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, March 4, 2022. I'm Russell Mokyber. Family Dollar said last week that it had temporarily closed more than 400 stores after the discovery of a rodent infestation and other unsanitary conditions at a distribution center in Arkansas touched off a far-reaching recall of food, dietary supplements, cosmetics, and other products. That's according to a report in the New York Times. A recent Food and Drug Administration inspection of the facility in West Memphis, Arkansas, found live and dead rodents in various states of decay, rodent droppings, evidence of gnawing and nesting, and products stored in conditions that did not protect against these unsanitary conditions. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. Regular listeners to the show know that Ralph is a big fan of maps of all kinds. Our next guest celebrates our multicultural ethnic heritage by mapping it all out. David? Father Al Fritsch is an ordained Jesuit priest, co-founder of the Center for Science and the Public Interest, and director of EarthHealing.info. Father Fritsch is the author of numerous books, including The Contrasumers, A Citizen's Guide to Resource Conservation, also, Healing Appalachia, Sustainable Living Through Appropriate Technology, and Ethnic Atlas of the United States, National Maps, 1980 through 1920. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Father Al Fritsch. Thank you very much. Yes, Al, as you know, we go back a long way. You came yeah. to Washington years ago and worked on some of our projects before you joined Mr. Jacobson and Mr. Sullivan formed the Center for science and the public interest, which has helped to revolutionize better nutritional practices in our country. But when you went back to your home area in Appalachia, you broke really new ground by applying science to practical problems of dealing with contaminated water, dealing with forests. You taught all kinds of people how to do science for the people, as your phrase went. So we want to point that out as well as one of your many accomplishments. But in this project you have, you're developing an ethnic atlas of the United States. And when I saw this, I wondered, I said, you know, every 10 years with intermarriage, internal migration in the U.S., yeah. gentrification, the concentration of ethnic and racial groups is being diluted or displaced. I mean, you'd have places in cities called Little Italy. They're no longer heavily populated by Italian Americans. How have you been able to demark these to the point where you actually have an ethnic atlas? Well, we used data in 1980 and then followed up on it. And you look at the number of people in the long form of the census that tell their ethnic group. And so after a while, you figure on a 10-year basis 
what a given it predominant characteristic will be of a certain county. Of course, you have to look at over 3,000 of them to find out which is the group that's most known in that. And most people do not realize, but 40% of the counties, German is the predominant. And then, but the Hispanics are coming up very fast. When you mentioned that there is that fading, which does occur, and we have examples of it showing, such as there were many areas that were Germans from Russia, there were Mennonites, Lutherans, and Catholics who came from Russia back in the 19th century, and they actually sent a person ahead in the Dakotas and several parts of the country, and they actually would uh, set up a place, and then the people would come and settle there. This was very important for a number of years, and so we show it in the 1990 census where they were located, but over time it became deluded, you might say, because the people would report themselves as being either German or Russian. They never remembered that they were a special ethnic group at that time. Actually, you were right about the Little Italy's, and of course, there are many examples of that. But what we fail to see now is that while we have a melting pot that is occurring when people declare themselves to be American, which about 10% of our people now do, But at the same time, there is a growing number of people in a greater diversity because of the Asian American increase, which has a lot of different groups in the country, and of course, the Hispanics. Now, there's so many reasons why you and your colleagues over 40 years have prepared this ethnic atlas. Uh, You mentioned societies that have diversity of ethnics are often enriched in many ways, not just different kinds of food, different kinds of music, but also different ways of solving human problems, some of which may be better in certain circumstances than others, and we can pick it up and learn from each other's ethnic heritage. But the big point you make is the relationship to the environment. Can you explain that? Well, it's like species of animals or plants so are the human beings are of different cultural species. And therefore, it's important for us to celebrate everyone that we have because greater diversity and mix with each other means it'll be a stronger America because we were actually people that were mixed from the beginning. We were not a single culture. We came together as a people that was, it, it was a federated situation and we still have it today. And the only trouble is, is that some people are getting scared about the fact that groups that they do not have close affinity to have actually become very strong lately, especially, say, Asian Americans or Hispanics from the viewpoint of white people who are really parts of like the Italians, Germans, French, and so forth. That They see their numbers in plateauing, if not decreasing, whereas this other group has come up enormously since from 2010 to 2020, over 5% of the United States increased in this minority group. And so we have greater diversity than we ever had. And what we're saying is we've got to celebrate it. It's something great that we can have with each other. And we're wanting people to actually join find out the ones. That's why we have 250 different groups listed in that ethnic atlas that people could come in various parts of the country and go to these meetings, celebrations, festivals, and so forth. So our idea is to see that instead of being something that is morose or that it's actually threatening people, rather it's something that is great and glorious. You know, Black and Hispanic groups are making that point in a very diverse way these days throughout the country. How do you distinguish between the word race and the word ethnicity? Well, there is a distinction, but of course, with the Hispanics, they cover both. And the Hispanics are listed usually along with Asian Americans, which would be a group that would be racial. And then, of course, the subsets of Asian Americans, such as Chinese, Japanese, and so forth, each of these are considered a racial group by the U.S. Census. At the same time, we'd say, well, just be aware of it, that there's these differences, but still they can be counted. They can be counted in a great way, which we can see the numbers of people, such as Hispanics, 
having both white, about 90 some percent, or black with Dominicans and so forth. And so there is that distinction that you can say a racial group that's black. And so we do admit this. And of course, the government does too, that there is a flexibility here when you do the actual counting. But the simple fact is they exist as racial groups. They exist as ethnic groups too. And that consciousness differs with different people. The Basque are extremely, for instance, they're very ethnically conscious. And say the Chinese are very racially conscious, you might say. But in both cases, you can count them, you can find where they're located, and you can actually give a a picture of it. Certainly, we've been learning a lot in the last five decades about the way Native American traditions have treated nature. We, out of the West, in industrialized society, nature was something to be conquered. And in traditional tribal history, nature is something to be respected and communed with, not conquered. So there are a lot of aspects to your report and your description that we don't have time to get into. But one thing really jumped out on me. And when you said many minor languages are in trouble, some experts estimate that of the nearly 7,000 spoken languages at the year 2000, half will be gone. Half will be gone by the year 2100, dying at the rate of one every two weeks. An effort is being made to save some of these languages, but for many, that's not promising. Can you give us a commentary on that? Well, for one, uh, my own grandparents' language was Alsatian. And when I go back to Alsace, several times I have, and my cousins once removed did speak Alsatian in their older years. When they die, their children only speak French. And we have actually watched the very death of one of those languages, and that was one of them listed, Alsatian, is actually dying right at this moment. But this can apply to a lot of languages such as the Native American ones. There's a large number of them where death is occurring very rapidly because young people simply do not get involved with their parents or grandparents. And that was my fault too, for many ways of not coming to my father and grandparents and asking them to uh, teach us this language. So this is happening because social media is causing it to a great degree. We have to have English, you know, in our country and Chinese to some degree later, but the people are losing the small languages throughout the world. And every one of them is a rich language. It has a lot to do that, that if it were saved, and it takes a lot of effort to save these, they could add to the cultural richness that we have. And so it is occurring, what you just said, and it's occurring at a very rapid rate. In fact, the, the rates were set in 20,000, and I believe that they're going at a faster rate than what they even said. We were talking with Father Al Fritsch. When the language goes, a lot more than the language goes. When the language That's becomes right. extinct, a lot of knowledge becomes extinct. A lot of exactly. tradition becomes extinct. A lot of wisdom becomes That's extinct. Right. So a lot of the things people did, we don't have it anymore. And how they saw each other, oh my goodness, the losses. I was down in the Wind people, a Slavic group from Eastern Germany. They have in Lee County, Texas, which is near Houston, they have a settlement there. We went in to that place and we asked if we wanted to meet some people that still spoke Windish. And they said, there's one old lady over there at the nursing home, and she could probably speak it to you. Now, here was a language that was dying in America. I don't know how it's doing, but it's dying also in Germany, too, for that matter. But are we able to save these languages? Some people are finding it out and doing it, but they're a very minor group. It's only maybe 100 to 200 languages are being saved that could have been heavily threatened. But we feel that if we have a better sense of culture, we could probably save more languages. That's what we're saying. Last question, Al. You have an intriguing question here. You say Appalachian as an ethnic group, question mark? What do you mean by that? Well, this is what bothers me very much. 
is that that's how we started. We wanted to figure out, because I was back in the region, I wanted to figure out what was the ethnic background of the region. The Scotch-Irish, which is the basic part of Southern Appalachia, Northern is still heavily Germanic, but in the Southern part, this language has been fractured to some degree by people not actually standing up and saying, I'm a Scotch-Irish person. Uh, Usually they'll say Irish, but not Scotch-Irish. And what happens then is they became their own culture, which was Appalachian. They were hillbillies, as people called them. What was happening was a culture was beginning to be formed that composed mainly of this basic group, but it also involved English and others. They were very tolerant people, accepting into their song and so forth, other subcultures that were in the area. In fact, the Appalachian people were very open to this, and therefore it was merging into a new culture. Well, I like the way you end your commentary when you say that continued cultural consciousness will help in the global collaboration needed to save our wounded earth. That was a quote. On that note, we have to conclude. We've been speaking with Father Al Fritsch about his, in collaboration with two others over decades, Ethnic Atlas of the United States. Thank you very much for your work and that of your collaborators as well, Janet Caldas and Mark Spencer, for that stamina over time. And thank you for the way you're making connections that often are not made in our present frantic public discussions. Thank Thank you, you, Steve and David, for having us on. We appreciate it very much. I want to thank our guests again, Professor John McWhorter and Father Al Fritsch. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap Up. A transcript of the show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Ralph wants you to join the Congress Club. To get more information, go to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website and in the top right margin, click on the button labeled Congress Club. We've also added a button right below that with specific instructions about what to include in your letters to Congress. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is the indefatigable Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Our social media manager is Stephen Wendt. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up. First, we had to cut a segment from the opening of our recording that we'd like to share with you now. Ralph, you wanted to start the show by talking about a couple of things, one having to do with a book that you're trying to get published, and the other with Jim Hightower's Lowdown, our old friend of the show. Tell us about that. Well, Jim puts out this monthly four-page newsletter, which is really tremendous. Over the years, he has well over 100,000 subscribers called The Hightower Lowdown. And his February issue really caught my attention because it explained how corporate concentration of power, how monopolies, oligopolies have fed this inflation spiral by taking advantage of the pandemic and having undue pricing power due to the lack of strong antitrust enforcement. And he talks about the rising costs of food. He talks about how some executives bragged about being able to pass all their costs plus additional profit onto the consumer. And so I urge you all to read this, The Hightower Lowdown, written by Jim Hightower himself from Austin, Texas. And you'll be able to argue this case in the coming weeks and months with your friends, neighbors, co-workers, that the principal increase in inflation comes from excessive pricing power, and not just in the meatpacking industry, not just in the food retail industry, but in the healthcare industry, as most people have experienced recently, and not just the drug industry that Joe Biden singled out appropriately in his State of the Union speech, but really right across the board, there has been a collapse of consumer capability to fight back and walk across the street to a competitor, so to speak, and punish the gouging seller. Well, very good to pick that up. And the other thing, there was a Wall Street Journal article this past week about 
you're trying yeah. to get a book published that is pr actually praises CEOs. Tell us about that. Yeah, after many articles and books taking apart corrupt CEOs for over 50 years, I thought that it was necessary to have higher standards by some CEOs as a comparison. Because if you just see, and there are tons of books now on corporate crooks, it's a golden age of muckraking. If you just read only about these corporate crooks, you don't have the proper frame of reference to throw up against them by showing that there are some CEOs who meet the bottom line, make profit, treat their workers wonderfully, pay homage to environmental necessities, and across the board exert their civic responsibility. So over the years, I've collected 12 CEOs, mostly mid-sized companies, who met those standards. So I decided I'd write a book called 12 CEOs I've Known and Admired. And lo and behold, I got turned down by one publisher after another, maybe up to a dozen publishers. They would write back and say, well, it's a well-crafted book, and it's really interesting, and it could be popular with readers. It's not footnoted and abstruse, but it doesn't fit. So this doesn't fit. I finally called up a couple of them and said, what do you mean it doesn't fit? And they said, well, it doesn't fit with your brand. It doesn't fit with your image. Harper Collins said he, they would immediately publish a book by me on corporate criminals. Well, I called up the Wall Street Journal reporter who specializes in covering publishers and authors, Jeffrey Trachtenberg, and he, he thought it was humorous enough to write a semi-serious funny article, which appeared on, in the Wall Street Journal on Wednesday, March 2nd. They did me the favor of portraying two of my recent books, which were undermined by the pandemic. All the promotion, like so many authors went through, went down the drain. And they were the Ralph Nader and Family Cookbook, Nutrition and Deliciousness Going Cheek by Jowl, so to speak, and the book on the Day the Rats Vetoed Congress by Fantagraphic Publishers. It's a way, as we've told many of our listeners and Congress Club members, to laugh yourself seriously into mobilizing to capture Congress from the corporations who now dominate it. So they were not willing to, they didn't think a book by you that said, here are some role models for good actions, for good CEOs, would sell. Well, they didn't put it that way. They just said your last two books didn't sell that much. And I tried to tell them they came out right in the middle of the pandemic, like a lot of other books. But it was all about it just doesn't fit with the kind of books that they are knowledgeable about promoting. In other words, they were specialized and I didn't meet the specialized framework. But I really don't know, Steve, what the real reason is. I have no idea. I'm determined to get the book published, and it will be published. But it, it was quite an experience, and uh, Trachtenberg thought it was important for the one million subscribers of the Wall Street Journal to read about it. Well, as speaking of someone who's pitched a lot of television programs and pilots, they never tell you the real reason. <laughs> well, weren't they kind of surprised, as you mentioned earlier, that Ralph Nader would be writing a book praising capitalists? It's kind of like a Nixon goes to Taiwan moment, I guess. That's what I thought the appeal was. And when I mentioned this book to various reporters and cable news business people, they wanted immediately to sign up and interview me when the book came out. CNBC, Fox Cable, various reporters. I told the publishers this, that it would be given well, considerable media treatment. It didn't matter. An editor, Simon Schuster, Bob Bender, who wanted to publish it, and he put it in front of his younger editors around the table, and they nixed it. I think part of it is the younger editors don't have much historical knowledge. Right. There's so much hatred right now for corporate CEOs. Nobody wants to hear of anybody in the C-suite doing good. Yeah, but you talk about the CEO of Patagonia, the CEO of Interface Corporation, who passed away a few years ago. These are spectacularly yeah. far-seen and responsible CEOs. And if we don't give these people visibility, there'll be no framework 
to throw up against these corporations who are doing bad things and saying that we're just responding to the marketplace and don't blame us. We're giving people what they want. All right. So check out the Hightower lowdown for his very cogent explanation about the real reasons for inflation. And good luck trying to get that book published, Ralph. I think it's important. And now we continue our conversation with Professor McWerther. Well, you know, this also leads to a certain hesitancy in language by people everywhere. You hear words like, like, kind of, sort of, you know, problematic, concerning, and then the uptick in the tone of the voice, which you hear almost all the time on talk radio. What do you think about that? I mean, after a while, it gets a bit irritating. <laughs> well, you know, the words problematic and concerning are euphemisms for blasphemous today. When people say something is concerning, they're saying, let's burn the heretic. But the uptalk that you're talking about and the proliferation of likes, to tell you the truth, here's where I will put on my linguist hat. I think that those things are an indication that people speaking even casually today are more concerned with seeing whether or not the person they're talking to is with them or not. They're trying to enter the other person's mind. They're checking. They're doing that more than ordinary people did before roughly the late 70s. And I'm not sure why, and it's something I want to make a study of when my life opens up a little bit in some mythical near future I'm always thinking about, because I really do believe that it's kind of a revolution in the Anglophone American consciousness. I think we're more careful and we're more considerate. I know a lot of people hear the uptalk and the likes as an indication of sloppiness or hesitancy. I hear it as a kind of vernacular civility. And I'm surprised at how common it's become starting in the late 20th century. And I wonder what it was. And I suspect it had something to do with the counterculture. I think it was a linguistic ripple effect that happened just a little later than we might expect. But you can listen to recordings of teenagers talking, ordinary gum-popping average teenagers in, say, 1961. And they sound like what they are, but not the uptalk and not the likes. The occasional you know but very different from now. And it's not that they were smarter. It's not that they were more staid. It's that it was a different time in a certain way. It, it, it fascinates me. I understand how you're hearing it, but a linguist is really reluctant to hear slovenliness in the way people talk. We view language as a science. And I just want to know why people are saying like so much. And I suspect that well, the answer is- the, the latest entry is right. When they say a mm -hmm. sentence and they say right, they're checking. They're checking to see that you're with them. It's polite in its sloppy way. I find it really fascinating, honestly. Well, let's bring in Steve and David here. And Steve, why don't you start? Professor, I wanted to ask you, you write about this third wave anti-racism, making Blacks victims and infantilizing. And those buzzwords, those or those or that language, those words seem to dovetail with language that was a pushback against social programs of the 60s that led to things like welfare reform of the mid-90s, where a lot of single mothers, many Black, were put out on the street. Do you worry at all that that language is in line with those very real outcomes? Which language do you mean, Steve? Infantilizing victims. I mean, that seemed to be like the Charles Murray school of this is why social programs don't work because this incentivizes and makes people victims. Right. Yeah. I think the way we talk about these things does have a way of implying that Black people lack any kind of control, that Black people need close to ideal conditions to thrive. There's a sense. And once again, it only makes sense if you see the religious nature of this. There's an idea that you're doing the right thing by depicting Black people as incapable. There's a sense that saying, yes, we can't, is somehow a victory. That's new in human history. Here's why we can't, God I don't know of any other people in the world where that was their idea of getting ahead. And it's one of those things, for example, welfare reform, 1996. It wasn't perfect. It certainly did not make many people who were poor middle class, but then again, nobody expected that it did. It actually did an awful lot of good. There is a whole multi-generational welfare culture that seemed perfectly normal in black communities, 
having been imposed on black communities by left-leaning white radicals in the late 60s, but that's another rant. It had become a norm by the 90s. It no longer is. There's a whole different tenor and flavor to underserved black neighborhoods because of how welfare reform worked. And yet the good word is supposed to be that it was a disaster. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that the people who predicted that black women were going to wind up shivering on subway grates were wrong. Nothing like that ever happened. And now we continue our conversation with Father Al Fritsch. Well, what are you going to do with this ethnic atlas of the United States and the explanatory material? Are you going to come out with a book so people could access it more comprehensively? It is a book in itself. We hope to have people understand the basic idea of it being ethnic and also being environmental. The two things can be together and that we should be interested in this. It's meant to cut down the amount of bias that exists in our culture. And that bias is hidden by many people. But in other words, we're saying all the cultures have something worth saving, something worth celebrating. So I think we've done just about, I'm almost 90. I'm your age, Ralph. And I I don't have a lot much more time. I don't know if I can do the 2030 census or not. I enjoy it. It was started as a puzzle, but then it became environmental as I went along, is that there's really something here. I hope others pick it up and do other books in the same order. We have a lot of basic material there that they can use. Just quickly, Steve, David. Yes, Father Frisch, I wanted to ask about the idea that in this country, especially in the last five or so years, ethnicity has been a tool to uh, divide us. And we see the rise of white nationalism, yes. which seems to be engendered by, you know, white, the white dominant culture, seeing that demographically, they're going to be a minority soon. That's right. What, uh, what are your feelings about that as, as an ethnographer? Well, that's what I'm trying to do is say that our center point is celebration, learn, go out to the other groups and actually join them in some ways. And they would really enjoy a day in a festival with other groups. What has happened with extremists is they do feel that they're losing their hold on the world. And therefore, the white English, you might say, supremacy has faded. An Anglo, then therefore they bring in other groups with them, but it's fading. There's no doubt about it. An average white woman is 1.7 children, and to reproduce our population takes 2.2. So therefore, the white race is fading in spots and not having a large immigration from Europe and parts of the Middle East, uh, this will continue. But my answer is, that's good to have them find that the other groups are there beside them and are really worth learning about. And uh, that is an environmental thing to do. I think young people understand that better than older people on this issue. David? Father, the French seem to insist on a melting pot. And America is conflicted on whether or not we're a melting pot. This seems to ebb and flow Right now, most Americans don't believe we should be a melting pot. I don't actually have figures on what different people believe, but I was trying to find out when I would visit people who voted for American, was it because they believed in a melting pot? And not necessarily so. What I was finding that when they had an understanding of several other cultures, they were not in favor of it. It was only when they considered their own as being the only important thing, did they have that melting pot aspect. I would say that only a small minority of Americans are really in favor of melting pot. I think most of them would say, oh, well, keep the others around. They have their their good treasures to give us to us all. I think that it is a minority. It's a powerful minority. And I'm unfortunately, it is mixed also with the biases that we had, but that's of course what we're fighting. That's what we're fighting against is to have that bias that is so strong that their group is the only important group in the world, you know? So I agree with you that it exists and is important in some ways, but I don't think it's as big as people think it is. 
And that's a wrap. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we talk to former Boeing engineer Ed Fearson about his ongoing warnings over the safety of the Boeing 737 MAX. Until next time. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Thieves in the temple. Change.